And I'm going to pass it over to our NPN director, Dr. Teresa Crimmins. Thank you, Erin, and thank you all for being here today. It is always, as always, such an honor and a pleasure and a joy to get to share this kind of information back with you all. It's really, truly one of my favorite parts of my job because it's where we get to see how things really are playing out in the way that, you know, in the perfect design that it should be playing out. So thank you for being here today. And of course, thank you for your efforts too. I can't say this enough. Without the efforts of volunteers like you all out there on the ground, getting your trusty observations day after day and week after week, and maybe even year after year, we wouldn't really have the network that we have and we wouldn't be making the impacts that we're making. So I know sometimes it can feel really isolated when you're out there, especially if you're all by yourself and you're maybe wondering, what am I doing? Are these data going anywhere? Do these get used by anybody? The answer is absolutely yes. And I am so excited to be able to share some of that, some of those um, findings with you back today. And I can also say that I can't cram it all into a, in one webinar either. There's so much now um, that we're going to have to do this more frequently, honestly. So just to start out, we would love to hear who is on the webinar here with us today. Um, are you a Nature's Notebook contributor or maybe not yet? <laughs> and if you aren't just yet, I'm hopeful that by the end of the, con the conversation that we're going to have here, um, that you might be convinced that this is a worthwhile use of your time. I know for me, it is. I spend a lot of time. No, I don't spend a lot of time. I try to get out there as regularly as I can. <laughs> I have about five trees in my backyard and a few other plants and cacti that I try to look at as frequently as I can. And sometimes it feels like a pain as one more thing on my to-do list, but when I get out there, I'm always grateful and glad that I did. All right, we have 85% that have voted, so we'll give it just another minute. So that's pretty good. All right, so that's really exciting. And I'm looking forward then to be able to share back with you then how your observations are being used because that's exactly what we are focusing on today. So do I close this thing, Erin, or do you? It should be closed now. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> I wanted to start out just by acknowledging all of you and how many folks there are contributing across the country. And this is, this is the number of individual participants that have contributed data in every year since 2013. Whoops, I don't know why that advanced. Um, Nature's Notebook actually launched in 2009, but for the sake of brevity, I started the graph at 2013. And really what I want to focus on here is that we rebounded, we really rebounded. If you joined this webinar last spring, you might recall that we, we showed a pretty significant drop in participation in 2020. And then we were um, talking about trying to recover in 2021. The truth is uh, a lot of folks do collect data on paper data sheets, and then it takes a while maybe for them to sit down and, and enter the data into the computer. Um, and it's at that point that it actually makes it into our database and, and turns into something that we can compile. But now when we're able to look back at how many folks contributed data in 2020, which was of course the year that COVID just kind of disrupted everybody's life in every way, um, it is incredible to me to see that we actually sustained participation through that year and even through 2021. So I am so grateful to every one of you and everyone else who's not on this webinar. And in a similar fashion, um, you might be aware too that one of the main ways in which we engage folks is not just as individual observers, but through groups that we refer to as local phenology programs. And probably a lot of you either represent one or are a member of one. Those are um, groups of folks that are, that are contributing phenology observations on the same plants at the same location or at animals at the same location. And we have hundreds of these located at various facilities across the country associated with master gardener chapters, um, associated at botanical gardens or um, nature centers at universities. Um, 
and so many other kinds of facilities that I'm not naming right now. And what's really great is that though we saw a small decrease in the number of LPPs participating in 2020 and 21, I don't think this is enough to be significant. And um, I am definitely hopeful and, and positive. I'm certain that we're on the, the upward trend again. So again, thank you. And if you are a participating local phonology pro program, you probably received a request to fill out a survey from Erin recently, um, our outreach coordinator who's here on the, on the call, because what we like to do is hear from you what, what you like about the program, where you're stumbling, what, you, what your needs are, what, um, what facets of it you benefit from or where you would really like to hear more. And I, this is an opportunity. These are everybody, all the groups that not only contributed data last year, but also filled out the form. And so thank you for that. And I wanted to give you all a specific shout out, but also this, this, this smattering of names gives us a sense of the, the breadth and diversity of groups that are, that are actively contributing data across the country too. So special thank you to all of you for also filling out the survey because what you share back with us is so important for shaping what we prioritize and try to do in the coming year. So just to kind of reset and make sure we're all on the same page, the reason why the network exists is primarily to collect, store, and then share freely that information, those observations that you collect about what's happening on the ground, on plants and animals and across the country. And those data and data resources are then used widely now to support scientific discovery and advancements, to support a whole host of different kinds of decisions, anywhere from human health, um, invasive species management, we'll get to some of these, to also communicate and connect about what the heck the word phonology means, why it matters, why it's worth keeping track of, and then also to grow an inclusive and, and equitable network. We're gonna focus primarily on the science uses of the data in the past year, and we're only focusing on the, the things that have happened in the last year in this webinar because there's so much, there's no way we could fit it all in a webinar, which is really exciting. Um, but we'll also mention some of the other things too. So I wanted to share this slide. This is a paper that was just published earlier this year out of the UK. And really, I, I share this as aspirational. You know, the UK has a phenomenal phonology observation program, not unlike Nature's Notebook, but there has been in existence for much longer. Um, they have a strong history of tracking phonology that dates back into the 1800s and then um, had a formal project called the Nature's Calendar um, it was a former iteration of it that stretched from the late 1800s all the way up until the mid 1900s and then got picked back up back in the late 1990s. And using observations that have come in from those networks, they've been able to reconstruct the date of flowering, the start of flowering there in the UK, which of course is much smaller than the US, so it's easier to synthesize the data for. Um, and there's less latitudinal and topographic variation in, in, uh, across the country too, um, compared to the US again. Um, but what we're seeing on this graph is the x-axis, it starts at about 1950 and stretches up to um, 2019. And what the y-axis is just is the day of year that flowering first occurred in those different years. And what we see is that up until the basically the 1980s, it bobbed around around whatever day 140 is. I'm not doing the math in my head very well. So that's in April, I think. Um, but there wasn't any trend really in those years. Then we had this huge change and then suddenly things are much earlier now. They've been much earlier since the 1980s and you can see that it is even drifting earlier and earlier in recent years. What's phenomenal to me is that this, all of this information, this, this time period, this record is be, because of observations collected by volunteers. And those observations reflect very clear patterns in uh, springtime temperature in the country as well. So this is kind of one of the ways in which we're hoping to go with our network. Um, we have a much shorter period of record. We're basically looking at this segment in time. And so we're not quite able to pull off what these guys were able to do in this paper. However, we're on our way because of the density of data that are coming in. However, we don't need to, this, what, what we've achieved so far is nothing to sneeze at. Um, at last count, and, and these are coming in every day, 
um, academic publications that have used the data now number over 100. And we've even had, I think it's four now that I've picked up so far this year, which is pretty great. Um, and that there's generally an increasing trend here in recent years too. People are becoming more and more aware of the data, data resource that we have. And the more years of data that we have, the more valuable that becomes. And so we are, I expect that we'll see increasing use as, as time passes. The types of ways that the data are used are many. Um, the papers that I'm gonna focus on today fall into two general categories. Um, one of the common uses for phenology data in science is to figure out what is it that actually makes things happen in plants and animals? What is it that makes certain species of plants put their flowers on in the spring? What is it that, that, that plants require in order to put their leaves on in the spring? In truth, we have a general understanding of this, um, and especially in springtime, and especially in temperate systems, it has a lot to do with temperature. But when you get down to the specific species and the specific location, it is more complicated than that. Snowmelt plays a large role in mountainous um, areas for certain species. Sometimes plants are day length limited, so they don't pay attention to how much warmth they're being exposed to until the days get long enough and then they start paying attention. Sometimes they need a certain amount of chill before they keep track of the warmth. Sometimes it's all of those things. And so in truth, we don't really know in a lot of species. And if we don't know that, then we can't really predict how things might change under future changing conditions or to currently changing conditions. And so there's a lot of research that's going into that. And the data that you are contributing to Nature's Notebook is very instrumental in, in making this possible. Prior to Nature's Notebook being launched, we really didn't have broad scale phenology monitoring in this country. And so we were not able to answer questions like that. The other thing that, the other way in which the data are being increasingly used are in looking for changes, changes in the timing, either in springtime activity or autumn activity um, at a location or across locations, not unlike what we just saw in the previous slide from the UK. So I'm gonna talk, that's basically what I'm gonna focus on today, starting with the drivers to phenology, the stuff on the left. So the first paper I'm going to cover is by a couple of authors out of California. And what they focused on specifically were five species of oaks in California. Um, and so if you track phenology of any of those, um, and I will name them, they're coast live oak, California black oak, blue oak, Oregon white oak, or valley oak in California then your data most likely was used in this analysis. And I put this map in here because this shows specifically the locations that data came from. And so again, if you're from California and tracking oaks, you're probably represented in here. They use data that were collected uh, spanning 2012 through 2019, and well over a thousand observations were included in this analysis. What they were looking to uh, try to ascertain was what drives leaf out, flowering, and fruiting in those five species of oaks. And what they looked at specifically to try to better understand this was winter and springtime total rainfall, as well as temperature conditions. So for those of you that are in the East, it might seem funny to be paying attention to things like rainfall, but honestly, in Mediterranean systems, like we have in much of California, the rainfall plays an important role in driving when things happen in, in different plants. And so what they found first was, actually, if I go back to those maps, you'll see that the, the data were collected across a pretty large geographic area. And if you know California, <laughs> there's, there is a lot of topography and we're seeing a lot of latitude being captured among those points. And so what the authors found when they looked at the timing of leaf out flowering and fruiting in these species was that the strongest predictors as to when these things would happen were actually spatial, um, measurements. It had to do with the latitude and the longitude and the elevation and then day length, which is honestly a function of latitude. And so what they uh, what that basically translates to is that if you're in the south or if you're at lower elevations, these things happen earlier in the year. And then if you go up in latitude or elevation, things happen later. Not so surprising, really. Um, but that also the other variables that that made the most difference were things like winter rainfall, total annual rainfall, and then maximum winter temperature. And 
how that trans how that works out is that either in warmer winters or wetter winters, all of those events tend to happen earlier. One thing that's cool though, and I didn't even know this until recently, is that oaks are funny. They hybridize. And there are these more closely related trees that are, let me step up, step back a, a, a notch here. So the kind of the standard definition of a species is something that can generate viable offspring. And so if you have two different species of plants exchanging pollen, you probably you might actually get a, a plant that, that comes out of that, but it won't have viable offspring. That's what that, that's what distinguishes a species. But then we've got this funny situation where we've got different closely related trees, distinct species that are in different groups. And the coast live oak and the California black oak are both in the red oak clade or red oak group. And then the other three that are in the study are more closely associated with white oaks. And what's cool is that <laughs> these plants actually do hybridize. They can exchange genes um, and then and, and, and I don't really even know what happens, <laughs> um, whether it's it, whether they're moving toward new species. I, and this is a very active area of research. And what's neat is we actually have a project that's launching this year. It's focused on several other oak species in the east, but exactly what they are focusing on there is the degree to which these different species of oaks hybridize. Where phenology factors in here, is that the species can't hybridize if they're not flowering at the same time. If they don't have the female flowers open in one species and the male flowers releasing pollen in a different species at the same time. And so the Quercus Quest campaign is actually focused on trying to better understand this and the degree of hybridization among, this is more focused on bur oaks actually, the bur oak clade, um, as well as some other additional features um, Things like the degree to which oak, or sorry, um, wasps perf, uh, create galls in them, um, and some of the interactions with hyphae um, and fungus in the in the roots. And so we actually, I have a slide later on that will tell us more. But we will be launching that campaign formally, and those researchers that are leading that effort will be sharing much more about that opportunity with that. But I wanted to mention it now because it's related to that other study. <laughs> and I don't even think those folks are talking to each other, so it's kind of neat. Okay, sticking in the vein of what drives species um, to do their thing when they do it seasonally, we have another really interesting study. These folks out of the Morton Arboretum in Illinois make the case that it's much easier to figure out what the drivers to phenology are when you have a lot of data. And for species, for, for many of the plants that are um, maintained on properties like Arboreta, Arboreta typically tend to have a lot of rare species. And so therefore, if you don't have a lot of information, a lot of phenology observations for species like the ones that are, that are um, kept at Arboreta that are rare, it's really tricky to figure out things like what are their drivers. So what these guys did, this is really clever. They said, what if we had data from our rare species that we track here locally at the Morton Arboretum but what if we did some fancy pants modeling where we brought in all of the observations from closely related species that are being tracked through nature's notebook too? Will we be able to draw, to create a more robust model and be able to say something about our local rare species by using that data and information from the much more widely monitored species tracked through nature's notebook? So again, it's another study focused on oaks. We've got seven more species of oaks and the maps here are showing, oh, sorry, my, my controls are hiding things. The orange square shows where the Morton Arboretum is. And then the yellow dots and the green triangles are all of the observations for the different oak species that were com contributed to Nature's Notebook that were used either in constructing models or testing the performance of the models for these different species. Similar to the other study, they cast a really wide net. They said, give us oak data for any of these seven species anywhere from 2008 to 2019. Um, and they ended up using over 5,000 observations. And as you can see, those observations are from the species ranges and even beyond. Um, the species ranges are shown in gray in the different maps. And in some cases, we actually have observations beyond the range, which is kind of cool too. 
So their, their, their primary question, I won't go into the details because it's complicated and I don't think I can do it justice, <laughs> um, but their main question was, can the data that are coming in through the NPN help improve those predictions for rare species? And the answer was basically yes and no. Um, yes, having more data did help. They were able to build more robust models. But when you bring in observations from all across the country, you're bringing in a lot of additional um, covariates there. Your observations are from different, um, different latitudes, different elevations, different soil types, different shade levels, different um, associations with other species. And all that site level variation actually creates a bunch of additional complexity that has to be a, accounted for in the model. So their take home was, this is great. This shows promise, but guess what? We need more data <laughs> and a lot more. It's both from across multiple more sites because that would allow, allow them to better control for that variation at different sites, as well as more years. Always more years helps too. Okay, sticking with that theme of models, <clears throat> we have another study where folks wanted to investigate how simple models like what we use at, here in the USA National Phenology Network perform and how they might be able to be improved actually. So some of you, you might be familiar with, um, actually I'm gonna jump ahead here, whoops. You might, some of you might be familiar with maps like this that we produce. Um, we call these our pheno forecasts. And the one that I'm showing here is for Emerald Ash Borer Adult Emergence. Basically what this map is showing is location by color, what the color represents is locations where activity in different species is either predicted to be occurring actively now, because um, this map is, actually this map is for the forecast for next week um, as of today. Um, so where do we expect emerald ash borers to be emerging by next Tuesday and where do we not? And the yellow color is the one that's showing where adults should be emerging. And everywhere else is where it's either past, the tan colors are past, or the green and purple are colors where it isn't yet there. How do we know this? Well, what we're implementing is a very simple accumulated warmth or, or um, growing degree day model. So what I'm showing here is at a single location, if you start your year at, at, on January 1st and you keep track of how warm it's been and you add that warmth that you've been exposed to at your location every single day, you generally will get what looks like this logistic curve going from winter through spring to summer. What, what this is basically showing is that you don't typically have a whole lot of warmth that you're getting exposed to earlier in the year, but then as the sun angle comes up, and conditions, conditions start to change, that amount of warmth starts picking up. Basically, your daily average temperature goes up and up. And so the amount of warmth that you're being exposed to in each day is greater. And then as you accumulate that, that, that slope increases. And then finally, you get to a point where it starts to level off. What a, what a lot of researchers have done is try to figure out exactly how much warmth a plant at your location needs to be exposed to in order to leaf out. This is some of the simplest models for um, predicting phenology. And in some species and events, it works. It works great that we can identify exactly how much warmth a organism needs to ex be exposed to. We keep track of how much warmth we've been exposed to at that location and boom, we can say that leaf out is gonna happen on this day and then it does. And same thing for bloom. Um, this is a basically how our spring index models work, if you're familiar with that. And that's how these phenol forecasts work too. For emerald ash borers, it's been established in the literature that it takes about 450, these are called growing degree days, but it's just a unit of warmth until those insects emerge. And generally it seems to work reasonably well across space. And so what we can do is just keep track across space, how much warmth a location has been exposed to. And then every day we're able to apply that, look at how much warmth a location has received, compare that to that threshold, and then make that prediction as to whether we're there yet or not. Well, that works okay for some species and in some it really doesn't. This is, some, this is a map from some work that a group of us published earlier uh, a couple of years ago where we were able to try to identify how much warmth 
eastern redbud needed to be exposed to in order to leaf out. And we came up with a threshold, and I don't remember what it was, but it was some amount of warmth. And then we said, okay, how well does this model perform? And if it's an orange dot, it, it um, I think it overpredicted, and if it was a blue dot, it underpredicted. And basically what you see really pretty clearly here is there's a very strong latitudinal gradient that our model works the best in the middle latitudes here, and then it gets worse and worse the further away you either go north or south. And so what this suggests is that eastern redbud, and this is true for a lot of species, their sensitivity to warmth varies by latitude. The species has adapted across its range to not all, not all the individuals across its range respond in the same way to the amount of temperature. The sensitivity varies by latitude. But if you know that, then you can account for it pretty readily in a model, honestly. And so that's what these researchers did in this next analysis, where basically they looked at our paper and they said, nice job, you guys, we can improve on this a whole lot. <laughs> and so they went back and grabbed nature's notebook data um, for the past 10 years for all of these different commonly observed tree and shrub species. And they focused on leaf out and they were able to make drastic improvements to the models. And we don't really have to understand these graphs in great detail. Basically what we're looking at here is um, on the left side, this is the equivalent of the graph that I showed you from the, the redbud paper, where the day of year that is predicted is really not aligning well with the day of year that is observed. Um, the red dots were the predicted day of year across latitude and the black dots were observed. And when you fit a line through them, you find that there's under prediction and over prediction, um, same as what we saw in the dots in the previous map. And it's, it's smack in the middle of the range where the two lines intersect. That means that's where the model actually, they're, they're agreeing. And the further away you get from that middle latitude, the worse the performance is. These guys did some nifty little modeling tricks and they were able to improve things dramatically. The graph on the right here is showing for the same species in the same locations, the, the agreement between predicted and observed um, for when leaf out should occur in, this was sugar maple, and they dramatically improved things um, just by using those data and a little bit more of a clever approach. <laughs> and so that's a kind of, um, uh, improvement that can definitely, it is advancing the field and we're, um, by making the nature's, no, nature's notebook data available, we're able to continue to um, support advancements in the field of modeling and specifically in, in phenology modeling. And then we can make improvements so that our forecasts are even better in going into the future. I will say one of the reasons we haven't launched a whole lot of phenol forecasts yet beyond what we have right now is because we are aware that in a lot of species, the really, really simple models don't quite perform as well as we would like. This right here, this RMSE of 32.4 days means that if we were to invoke, if we were to use that very simple approach, you could be off, your prediction could be off on average by as many as 32 days. And that's not really very helpful, honestly, for predicting when, when something will happen. And so we've been hanging back waiting to figure out the best approaches, you know, that, that trade-off between model complexity and model accuracy before in, uh, launching more you know, forecasts. Uh, one other paper that I thought was really interesting that also is still looking at the drivers to phenology is this one that came out in the Remote Sensing of Environment journal recently. And I just wanted to mention this because again, um, the, the observations that you're collecting on the ground are some of the most important pieces of information for being able to interpret and validate and verify the information that's being collected by satellites. And so I just have a kind of an idealized image of what that looks like. As you probably know, we have, I don't even know, hundreds, thousands probably of satellites orbiting the earth right now, sharing and collecting all sorts of information. And there are a handful of satellites that are focused specifically on keeping track of what's happening on the ground, specifically vegetation and changes in vegetation um, from one scan to the next. And different satellites collect data at different resolution and at different temporal frequencies. But there is a whole science that, that is, is rapidly developing that is taking those that information that's being collected by the satellites and comparing it with 
the observations that are being collected on the ground and specifically your observations again to answer all sorts of kinds of questions and in this question in this paper in particular the researchers were digging in further on what controls the leaf out what controls leaf out in deciduous forests because you might remember earlier on I said <laughs> we still don't really know in a lot of species we don't know and it's further complexified by things like even when we think we do know we are discovering that it's changing. So under warming conditions, it's recently been observed that different species sensitivity to warmth. So how responsive they are to how much warmth they've been exposed to is changing. As well, the period of time that they, that they actually pay attention to that warmth is changing. So it's a very dynamic system and there's a lot of opportunity to take advantage of the information that we have to disentangle and better understand these things again, both to just for, for scientific knowledge and contributing to our better understanding of what's happening, but then also so that we can better be prepared for what, the, what changes we might experience as the climate continues to change. And so what we do know that is, is again, is that in general, leaf out in deciduous forests is governed by either the amount of chill it's been exposed, the trees have been exposed to in, this, in the winter, how much warmth it's being exposed to, the day length, meaning how many hours of day or, or light we're seeing in a 24 hour period, or some combination of those things. These folks dug in to try to better understand that and in this particular analysis, they really focused a lot more on imagery that's been collected by different satellites and different products of that. However, they used observations that have been contributed on, from the cloned lilac network to help verify this. And I'll just go on a short detour here to say that if you are someone who is tracking a lilac, that's especially important. Those data, you might recall that I said earlier on, before the, the, um, the National Phenology Network was established, we really did not have broad scale phenology monitoring in this country. We had a number of locations where people, individuals were very dedicated in keeping track of things in, uh, on their own. And so we have good deep records of a handful of locations in the country, but we really only had one other network <clears throat> where, where broad scale uh, observations were being collected. And that was focused specifically on lilacs and honeysuckles. <laughs> Excuse me, and the um, the National Phenology Network has continued that to to sustain that tradition because clone lilacs have been in observation since the late 1950s, and that's such an important temporal record for us to work from. Um, and then we also expanded to common lilacs because cloned lilacs are trickier to get a hold of. However, if you have interest, we can point you in the right direction for where to get one. Um, yeah, and so the lilacs are especially important because they, they, they help us extend that record that goes back the furthest in time in this country um, to be able to connect what's happening now. So anyway, that's the data that they used in this particular study. And the really fascinating finding was that across um, the range of these species, these, these um, temperate and boreal forest trees in the east, the controls between therm refers to temperature and photo refers to photo period. I'm sorry, I should have spelled that out there. Um, it really fell out latitudinally where photo period is a much stronger control in the south and temperature is a much stronger control in the north. And so this is, this is, this is really interesting because again, this kind of is a similar finding with what, again, we were saying in redbud where in a species range, you don't have the same response among all the individuals across the space necessarily. And so that's important to know because if you're going to implement a model and try to make a prediction, a forecast as to when something might happen, you have to be able to account for that. And so again, <laughs> all of this active research is if anything, making me more anxious about <laughs> making more forecasts because we want the forecast to be correct. And so this is really important research and um, again, helping shape what, what kind of products we might help, we might make in the future. Okay, shifting gears just for a short bit here. I also wanted to acknowledge one of the recent papers that has looked at what, how things are changing. And I thought that this paper was so fascinating because it focuses on autumn phenology, which generally doesn't get the attention the way springtime phenology does. 
Um, this particular group of researchers wanted to see how degree of urbanization might impact fall phenology. You might know, because we might have talked about this before, um, that urbanization in a lot of places impacts spring phenology um, because urban areas tend to be warmer. We tend to see earlier leaf out and flowering within more urban areas compared to their rural counterparts. However, that, that um, relationship varies by latitude and it is a stronger difference between urban and rural areas at higher latitudes than it is down south. So these researchers wanted to see, do we see any sort of pattern that is similar um, for autumn? And so what they did was gather up as much data for fall phenology for leaf senescence as they could out of a nature's notebook. Um, it was 2009 through 2018 for a whole bunch of different species. And what they found was, yes, kind of the same pattern. It again, really varies by latitude. And so what we're looking at here is each of these lines is, um, it's, it's representing locations with different annual average temperatures. So the purple is the lowest temperature or the highest latitude locations. And so what we're seeing on the x-axis is population density. So on the, the lower number would be less dense population and the higher numbers would be um, more dense, so more urban. And then this is the, the date of senescence, day of year. And so as we go up, what, looking at the purple line again, which is the, the high latitudes, the cold areas, the more we go up in dense population density, the later fall phenology is pushed. And in some, as we, um, this is log transform, so it's hard to know exactly what the density refers to, but it's, this line is showing over a month later. Then when we flip to the opposite, the yellow line, that's referring to locations with much higher at annual average temperatures. Um, that's the lowest latitudes in the country. This is actually like low, Texas and, and much of Florida and not a whole lot else, a little bit of um, Louisiana, we actually see the inverse relationship where at lower latitudes, we have later senescence. And then as we have an increase in density, it actually promotes senescence. Leaves start to, to um, change and drop earlier in the year. And this was kind of an interesting finding. Um, and actually, this is another kind of version of that same thing. It shows you how the, the length of growing season changes with that increase in population density by temperature. So again, as, as um, population density increases at high latitudes where it's cold, we have a longer growing season, but that the further south you go, as you have increasing urbanization, it actually decreases. And there's two reasons they propose this might be, and I thought these were so fascinating. One is that in urban areas, you are experiencing, the plants are perhaps experiencing greater drought stress, especially at those low latitudes, because it's already hot. And then the urban urbanization makes it, the urban heat island effect makes it even warmer. As well, you've got a lot more impervious surfaces, so it's harder for rainfall to infiltrate. And so those plants might be experiencing greater drought stress and therefore just having to you know, quit photosynthesizing earlier because they get they get tapped out, maxed out. Or really it's an and, it could be an and. Um, it's also been proposed that trees may have a carbon sink limitation where if they are starting their phenology, springtime phenology earlier in the spring, then they can sequester X amount of carbon and once they hit that max, then they need to be done <laughs> and they decide to shift to senescing. Um, and that may indeed be what's uh, um, happening here too, or it may be both. We don't really know. And again, more data, more information can really help us first identify what the outstanding questions are. And then secondly, hopefully pursue those, be able to pursue those and, and disentangle those things even further. Oh, uh, sorry, this is a map <laughs> of the places where that yellow line, the colors on the map basically kind of match this. And so the yellow line, again, where, where the growing season is getting shorter um, with increased urbanization is basically your lowest latitudes in the country. However, as, thing, as urbanization increases, we can expect that to continue in the same vein. Okay, I'm gonna stop with the, um, the uh, reviews of papers there because I could go on all day because it's so fun, but I know it's a lot. But I wanted to draw your attention in case you didn't know that we have the opportunity 
to learn more either about many of these papers or many others that have used our data. Um, on our website, on the Nature's Notebook part, if you go to the more ways to connect um, menu, there's this, there's this link called highlighted publications. And if you click that, click that, it brings up very short blurbs that you might recognize from some of the newsletters. Um, and if you click on any of those, you get a, a slightly longer expanded um, uh, explanation. What we try to do about every other month is find a recent paper that's interesting, that we think is interesting, either that uses nature's notebook data or is just fascinating findings from the field of phenology and try to, to um, condense it down and make it a little more approachable and summarize the most key findings for you. So if you don't know about these, definitely check them out. And they, you probably, if you get our newsletters, you probably do see them. But if you don't get our newsletters, then you definitely should sign up to receive those too. We have three different newsletters that come out at various times over the, the year. Um, one that's, that is uh, intended primarily for everybody who participates in Nature's Notebook. So that gives you a lot of information about the program and what's new and what's coming. We have one that's more uh, oriented toward local phonology project leaders and, and partner groups. And then we have one that's more oriented toward the researcher scientist crowd, but there's no harm in signing up for, you can sign up for as many as you want. And I think Aaron's putting the stuff in the chat on that um, because that's definitely one of our primary ways of trying to share updates with you all, um, including publication summaries. I'll take just a couple more minutes to talk about just a couple of the other ways that are that your data are being used too. Um, although again, I think we need a whole nother <laughs> webinar to unpack some of these. Um, land managers, folks at Fish and Wildlife Refuges and National Parks and increasingly now US National Forests and even um, Bureau of Land Management units, state and local parks uh, are using these data to support invasive species management, both insects and plants, um, things for things like tracking food sources for migrating species, especially pollinators, but we're growing more in that area, um, and better understanding and tracking potential emerging mismatches between species that have been in the past adapted to undergo different phenological transitions at the same time of the year. Um, we also got a good question, and I definitely wanted to share this. Who else uses the data? Are there for-profit folks using the data? And by and large, not yet, not to our knowledge. However, I did want to make a mention of a couple of neat uses, um, especially the more derivative products, like our maps that indicate leaf on, like when spring leaf on is occurring, has been demonstrated to be really appreciated by folks who are... Um, collecting aerial photography for various uses. Um, and they, the, the, the two images that you're seeing here is a picture of aerial photography, um, low, low altitude aerial photography on the left where leaf is, leaves are not on the tree yet and on the right where they have started to leaf out. And our, our Spring Index product does help for a lot of these kinds of applications because you don't wanna bother flying planes and drones collecting imagery if you're gonna have a lot of tree canopies obscuring what you're doing. And so what we've heard about is that in a couple of cases, those products are being referenced to help schedule um, things like that. And we had even one really interesting application, I think it was out of New York, where they said, you know, thanks very much for that product because we use it to try to understand whether there's illegal building going on. And I think it was a, um, a municipality who was using that information in that way. There's a lot of act a lot of additional opportunity there, though, for for uses of the data in ways that can really benefit humans and society. And a couple of areas where we have active projects going on include um, better understanding the allergy season, looking at the vectors of disease and their seasonal activity, and even better trying to understand carbon sequestration. In all three of these realms, we have active projects going on with different partners um, where either where we are um, actively looking at the, the information that, that Nature's Notebook data give us and how information that, that can benefit society can be gleaned from this information. And so I'm really looking forward to being able to share more about all these different kinds of projects and more as we get a little further down the line. In addition, <laughs> Inspired by this webinar that we did last year, 
uh, a group of us internally wrote, tried to write a paper about the various ways in which your data are being used. And that paper is currently under review and revision for uh, a journal. However, we're happy to share a preprint with you all if you're interested to read. And so I think Erin's going to put the link to that in the chat too. Um, because again, more than anything, we just want to share this all back with you <laughs> um, so that you can see how valuable what you're doing really is to, to science and society. Okay, in the last couple of minutes, I'm going to share a few things that are forthcoming out of our team and our office in this year. We're really excited to share a couple of, of updates. Uh, one is that we have two new data collection campaigns this year. I mentioned the Quirkus Quest one earlier. We also have one focused on Redbud um, better, to better understand um, mast years and whether, whether red buds do mast, meaning put, have certain years where they put on a whole lot of seed pods and other years where they do not, as well as whether the timing of fruiting and flowering in red bud is changing. As I mentioned too earlier, we have a kickoff campaign for the Quirkus Quest campaign, and, or a webinar, sorry, a kickoff webinar for the campaign <laughs> happening in a couple of weeks. And that one I'm looking forward to attending because I know I'm going to learn more from the project leads on exactly what um, this project is all about. So the Aaron will put the link for that in the chat and you can learn more on the, the page on our website for that. And of course, we have all of many of our uh, campaigns that you might already be familiar with too, um, continuing on this year. So thank you for your participation or consideration of those. Another thing that I am so excited to share is we have a brand new volunteer engagement coordinator, Samantha Brewer, who just started yesterday. And we are very much looking forward to having her help shape more um, our, our recruitment and our retention activities. And so this is a name and a face that you will quickly become familiar with. Um, we're so glad to be growing the team again and so excited to have Sam join us. She comes to us. We're so lucky. She was a Nature's Notebook local phenology project leader at our local zoo here in Tucson at the Reed Park Zoo and set up a pollinator garden there and sold the whole zoo on the concept of Nature's Notebook and phenology monitoring there. And so she brings experience, familiarity, and tons of enthusiasm. And so we're so happy to welcome Samantha to the party here. Also, I so can't wait for this one. Oh my gosh, this is so long time coming. We have a new website, very, very actively in the works. Erin has been so influ influential in shaping this and we and our, our other wonderful IT gentleman, um, Nathan, who joined us last year and Jeff have been very hard at work for months now on trying to all three of them are working so hard on streamlining the navigation through the sites, making it so much easier to discover organization groups that are actively participating near you that you might want to join up with or share anything resources, manpower, woman power, enthusiasm with. Um, so much easier to get started, navigate your way around the site. Um, I've had some sneak previews of some of the functionality and I can definitely attest to it really is they're putting so much thought into it and, and it looks so much better. It looks so much better and it's functions so much better. We don't yet have a rollout date because in um, honestly, we don't want to roll it out until it's functional. We don't want to, we don't want to do what some of those other shall not be named groups do when they launch a new version of something, <laughs> Microsoft. Um, we want to make sure it's functional, but uh, it's coming and it's we're making great headway on that. Okay, one more pitch. If you haven't taken the local leader certification course for, for local phenology leaders, we're running another one of those this spring uh, starting in mid-March. So if you're interested in that, we are currently taking applications and you can learn more about that on this page here. And I'm sure Aaron's got that in the chat. And then finally, We've been hearing for a while, and definitely this, this came front and center through the, um, the LPL survey too that, that uh, you, many of you on, on this call filled out. One of the areas that you're really seeking some more support in is being able to better 
get your hands on your own data and synthesize it and identify patterns or changes or just being able to get something more out of it beyond what you're able to see through the visualization tool, or maybe even um, if you download the data through the phenology observation portal, what you're able to do. And so this is our commitment that um, this year, that is definitely going to be a active area of development for us. Um, we hope to be working with many of you closely, seeking your, your input and your thoughts on what shape this could take. We're envisioning anything from more webinars to um, workshops, to modules, to um, printed material and PowerPoints that you may, may be able to download and work your way through, maybe all of the above, probably not all at once, <laughs> um, but we definitely want to be able to offer greater support so that you feel like what you're doing is worthwhile for you personally and for your group locally so that you can better understand what's going on in your data. So please stay tuned. We will be communicating more about seeking first seeking input on what shape and form that might take, and then secondly, starting to hopefully actually share out some materials along those lines. Okay, finally, I would love to hear, <laughs> I know this was a lot of information, and like I said before, it's not even half of the, I didn't summarize even half of the papers that used data last year, and so um, I was curious to hear if you like this and if you would like another version <laughs> later in the year. And I guess the answer is resoundingly yes. <laughs> so, okay, that sounds great to me. <laughs> um, it'll, I imagine it'll probably be more like, probably like August. Um, I'm gonna try to avoid maybe summertime because I know a lot of folks are traveling then, um, but not drift too late in the year. Uh, but this, the, and this gives us time to just prep and get all this stuff together. But okay, thank you for, for that answer. I appreciate that. Thanks for such positive support feedback too. Um, okay, with that, I am so hopeful that you're starting to see signs of spring your way. And if you aren't yet, um, here's a few sneak previews for you. Hopefully it's coming soon. And I'm happy to answer questions if you all have any. Thank you so much. Thanks, Teresa, for that amazing summary of all of the publications or a couple of the publications from last year. Um, so we had lots of activity in the chat. Um, I did want to mention that Lorian Whittle from the Nature's Calendar is here with us. So she said thanks for the shout out. So that's cool. Oh my gosh, I hope I didn't misrepresent anything. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. And then I'd love had, to talk. Yeah, a few questions in here. Um, so a couple of the more straightforward ones. Um, we had a question about the app and how you know if your data have been uploaded. So I just wanted to make that clear. So there's actually two different things to look at on the app on the review screen to know if your data are getting uploaded. One is there should be a green bar across the top that says user data are up to date. And if you see that, then you're good. If you see a, a yellow or orange bar that says not up to date, then you need to try to get into Wi-Fi and then sync so you can make sure your observations get uploaded. But there's another thing at the bottom that says complete versus incomplete. And so that has to do with whether you've reported a yes or no to all the questions on all of the species that you have on your, your site. So you can still have submitted data that are in the database, but still be incomplete if you've skipped some of the questions. And that's fine to skip some, you know, they're all optional. So that's fine. But you can also, if you want more information, you can tap that complete incomplete at the bottom to see the description of what that means. And then another question was about the campaigns and how, what it means to actually sign up for a campaign. So I just wanted to reiterate that um, you can contribute data on any of the campaign species and they're automatically counted towards the campaign. Um, but if you wanna get the emails for the campaign, which is you know, tips and results, then you need to sign up and the, register, the sign up links are on each of the campaign landing pages. Uh, so you need to do that extra step if you wanna hear from us about the campaign. And then, so we did have a couple other questions that um, I'm gonna ask Teresa to help answer. So one of them has to do with going back to the, the studies that you talked about that have to do with latitude versus warmth and how sensitive species are. And I think it might've been a little confusing with um, what it means and why those species would be not responsive at higher latitudes or lower latitudes. So if you can say anything more about that. Yeah, excellent, excellent question, excellent point. Yeah, so, 
especially at high latitudes, um, what I understand is that particular species have this built-in kind of safety mechanism where it takes more warmth to trigger them to actually do something like open those leaf buds so that they don't get tricked by a warm spell that might occur early in the year. Like in sometimes, sometimes you do have those random warm notes in or warm bouts in December or January. And if species only needed, if, if individuals only needed to be exposed to that small amount of warmth, it may be enough to kind of trick them into thinking it's spring and then put them at risk for frost damage. And so um, that is, a, as I understand it, that's kind of maybe not the only reason, but one of the, one of the big reasons why, um, why plants at Northern latitudes need a, 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 a larger amount of warmth initially to get going. That's great, thank you. And then I'm just looking for the other question I wanted to mention from Bettina. Um, are researchers able to use data for birds and other animals? Is there likely far more variables that might cause them to start nesting or migrate? <laughs> oh man, so for sure, any of the phenology data that's being contributed on animals to Nature's Notebook is, is just as available for researchers or anybody to use. I don't know though, if we do have any papers that have been published that, that, have, that have taken advantage of the animal data. And I don't know if that might be, it's probably has something to do with the fact that the large majority of the data that have been contributed is for plants. And so it's harder to you know, ascertain a signal from more you know, um, sparse data, honestly. So that probably has a lot to do with it, but there may be also just a lack of awareness among user communities that that's something that we have available. Um, and so, yeah, that's actually, that kind of, that kind of brings to mind that, that it's an opportunity for us, at least on our end, to make sure that potential user communities are aware that, 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 that exists. Um, yeah, definitely. However, some, oh, go ahead. I think you might've been ready to say the same thing, that those animal observations are more often used in management decisions um, and actually that, that bioscience, the, that, that paper that we submitted to bioscience, the preprint that I think Erin might've shared does talk about several of those examples. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to say too, cause I know um, the groups, especially the Audubon group in California have been contributing data for five years now. So it is a great data set. And I think we could do more to get the word out to the right people to make sure they know that those are there. And I think, um, and something that's really cool about Nature's Notebook is you can do plants and animals at a single site. So there's so much potential there for people to really dig into what's happening. So we should definitely try to spread the word more. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point of feedback. You're right, that, Bettina pointed out that we don't very often report on what we're seeing with the animal data. And I think you do through those Audubon um, newsletters, but otherwise she's right. So yeah, that's a thank you. That's a great point of feedback. Another question from Jody about the, um, on the prediction maps, uh, the greener forecast, why are some states left out? Is it because you don't get sufficient data? No, actually great question on those too. Um, it's it's de generally shaped by the species range. And so, but <laughs> a lot of the phenol forecasts we run are for um, species that we're trying to control there. And so they may be invasive species and they may be actively spreading. And so our maps may not incorporate states that they should incorporate, honestly. But yes, that, that's it. It's that at the time that we launched it, at least, that was our best information as to the distribution of the species. All right, I think that's all the questions so far. Feel free to ask any more. We can hang up for a couple more minutes if needed. Um, just a lot of people saying, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you all. <laughs> Thanks for being here today. Uh, okay, one more question from Lorianne. In the UK, we have other projects and organizations that specialize in an animal group and collect abundance, distribution and phenology. Um, so often the analysis will use nature's calendar plant phenology and combine with phenology from those uh -huh. other specialized organizations. So maybe things like eBird or um, other mm -hmm. uh, Project Feeder Watch, people that are exclusively focused on animal or bird data. Um, I don't think we have any examples of how those data have been combined with ours. We've done a couple in-house things in the past, but 
Mm -hmm. um, there's definitely a lot of potential there, but not a lot has been done so far. Yeah. The UK is just ahead of us on all those fronts, honestly. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's it for the questions in the chat. So we are going to send a follow-up email. It will have the recording to this webinar, as well as um, the list of the publications that Teresa talked about, and then the link to our highlights, you know, our summaries of the publications as well. But thank you, everyone, for coming. We really appreciate all the engagement in the chat and all the great questions. And we so appreciate all of your efforts in Nature's Notebook. Thank you.